Hi, everyone. This is Luke Johnson from Noetic.online, the humanities teaching platform and social media network, back with Bob Schutt for installment 16, I believe, of Soren Kierkegaard's training in Christianity. Today, Bob, what will we be discussing? Oh, today we're going to talk about what's called the triumphant church versus the militant church. And we'll see what Kierkegaard has to say about that. Uh, in, case, in case you don't know anything about it, you will in a few minutes. Fantastic. Let's get it going. Okay, so there's two expressions he uses for the church. He called the church militant and the church triumphant. These are terms that have been around for a while. Uh, so it's not like Kierkegaard invented these terms. Uh, the church militant is the church that struggles against sin and the devil and the world. Uh, and the church triumphant is a term used to refer to the church that has the beatific vision and they are in the kingdom of heaven. So it's more like uh, the church in the world faces the church in heaven. Uh, as far as what the significance of those terms are. So we are the triumphant ones in that we walk with Christ and have finished our walk with him. And the, the uh, uh, emphasis is on finished our walk with him, as we'll see. He says that Christ is different from all men. Uh, and he calls it uh, the heterogeneity of Christ or the, the difference between Christ and other men, uh, especially when it comes to the second coming. So speaking about Christ in the second coming is not like speaking about any other man. Like most men don't claim that they're going to come back again. I think Houdini claimed it, but he never did make it. Uh, but he's the only one I ever know of who actually tried to lay a claim that if there was a way to come back, he would. And he didn't. Uh, but Jesus, uh, well, it's not like speaking about someone who had a great victory and has his moment of fame and nothing else is heard about him. Uh, least of all that he would come again in a second coming. But Jesus did live on earth and his life was a pattern, capital P, for us. Then Christ ascended on high and now has to begin our journey by living according to the pattern that he set for us. So Christ was many things savior and so forth, uh, redeemer. Uh, but one of the things that he was that many people forget is that he was a model. And Kierkegaard uses the term pattern for us, that we ought to look to Christ as our pattern. And uh, any other individual is not a pattern for us, nor will he come a second time. So he's making, again, the distinction between Christ and other people, other persons, uh, even religious persons. We should be very careful when we pick someone and say, we're, uh, we'll make a pattern of him and we'll live our lives just like him, no matter how good they are. We should always have Christ as the pattern. When it comes to the truth, and this is what we're going to speak about today, there's no shortcut. Uh, and this is going to be an interesting discussion, Luke, because we're going to talk about truth. He's going to hit it head on this time. Not going to be evasive or uh, any circumlocution. We're going to hit truth straight on. What then is truth? And in what sense was Christ the truth? Now, you remember during the trial, Luke, uh, that Pilate asked him the famous question. He said, what is truth? And uh, there's been many strange ideas as to why Christ didn't answer him when he was confronted with, with that. Uh, but Kierkegaard tells us that the reason he didn't answer is because Christ was the truth. How could Pilate even ask what the truth is when Jesus was the truth? It's, so, it's, it's a little bit, um, I'm trying to think what would be the analogy it's it the i mean the answer wouldn't be distillable into uh a mathematical logical question e equation or answer right i mean right he wouldn't be able to answer it linguistically right christ didn't understand i mean Pilate didn't understand the truth so christ's life on earth 
was the truth. And this caused a great confusion in Pilate as well as any other man who asks the question. Uh, this, or actually Pilate revealed his misunderstanding of what the truth was by his question. So if Christ would have answered it, it would be almost a way of him authenticating his misunderstanding. It's, it's, it's a little bit like an outright refutation that the truth is something philosophical or objectively knowable if Christ doesn't even engage in the, the discourse on it, right? And remains silent when that question is asked of him. Right. right. One, one, of the, yeah, one of the things about Christ that we don't acknowledge uh, or, or make a claim to is that he didn't allow himself to get drawn into uh, these arguments that really would be counterproductive to his mission. So it wasn't the thing, it's not that Christ could have given a, an answer to Pilate that stumped him or, or given some grand, beautiful philosophical answer. It's not that he couldn't have done that, because I believe he could have. But it would have been misleading. And it would have only been for Christ's point of winning the argument. Well, uh, we, or, we certainly know that he could have done that. I mean, at a very young age, he was at like 12 years old, he was I, running, running circles around uh, the, the priest class. Right. And, and I think this is also significant in the fact that if man controlled the scriptures and what they said, I think they would have been able to write something very eloquent here, giving Christ's answer to Pilate. Instead, they didn't have an answer that he gave to Pilate, which again makes a person wonder, well, why didn't he answer it? It's, it's, it can be taken as a very negative thing. And so if people were creating scripture, it seems like this would have been a weak link in their creativity. They would have done a better job right here. You would have seen man's ego pop right, pop out right here. Saying, so well, you, I know so, what the truth is. So you think this is actually a, an attestation to the scripture not being a forgery because any man would have filled in the blank with a thought doctrine. And because Absolutely. Is that, that's interesting. I, I appreciate your perspective on that. The fact that there's, the fact that he doesn't utter something is is an indication of its authenticity. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, and, and we should look for scripture for those things, for those little kind of like it's not the notes, but the silence between the notes. Right, that, right. That that makes us really understand what what's going on here. So if Christ tried to answer the question, or would have tried. He would be admitting or implying that he was not the truth and that the truth was something external to him. So there was no answer that he could give to anyone. So Pilate thought of Jesus as one who might have been a teacher or a prophet who could give him some grand explanation of the truth so that now he too could share in the truth and have right. knowledge of the truth. Right. Right. Knowledge, right? As if it, as if it's merely cognitive, right? As right. But when a man claims to give such a truth, it's only a momentary point in time that one feels illuminated by truth, rather than a lifetime of following the pattern. So God is leading us into this understanding, differentiating between what philosophers consider to be truth and what Christians or what God thinks to be truth. I think that's a, I think that's really important. You know, one of the things that I don't think is emphasized enough in philosophy departments is like what Pascal did when he had uh, he had that that expression sewn into the back of his, I believe it was into the back of his jacket, or maybe he just uttered it, but he said something to the effect of the God of the philosophers is not the same as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do I have? Yeah. Do you, Do you know what I'm referencing? Does that sound vaguely? Right? Vaguely, right. I do. Uh, I think. Uh, it was uh, St. Augustine, I think it was him, who said, uh, what has Rome got to do with, what has Jerusalem got to do with Athens? In other words, what does spiritual Christianity have to do with philosophy? And uh, so it, on page 183, just to keep those who are following, uh, Christ is the truth in a way that being the truth is the only explanation of what the truth is and can be. So this, this, I think it puts it in the very subjective category. However, 
However, and some of the arguments that I've had with people, there's a difference between human subjectivity and God's subjectivity. If we say truth is subjective, it means whatever we want it to mean, which many people believe that's what it means. But if there is a God and truth is subjective, truth is whatever God wants it to mean. And in that case, that that uh, our, our subjectivity becomes uh, subsumed by it. It becomes overwhelmed by God's subjectivity. So you know, people argue that point about the subjectivity of truth. And my comment to that is to them, yeah, I don't have a problem with it. It's God's subjectivity, though, not yours. And that kind of alters the conversation quite a bit. So you can ask an apostle or a Christian what the truth is, and they can simply point out, behold him, learn of him. He was the truth. Kierkegaard says that the truth is not the sum of sentences. It's not a definition of concepts, but rather it's a life. And it's not a duplication of being in terms of thought, uh, which, which is an interesting concept. <clears throat> Sometimes we, or, or some people try to duplicate being in the concept of thought. But you can't do that. You lose the whole dynamic of, of the living human being when you create a thought concept of humanity. So a person is not a thought concept. It is a living human being. Uh, he also says that it's not truth. It's not a cobweb of ideas in the brain that have no relation to reality. No, truth is very being. It's the reduplication in me, you, him, that expresses truth so that my, thy, and his life are striving to attain this truth. So Kierkegaard puts life into truth here. It's the very being of truth in the sense of a life. So it kind of takes it out of the textbook and makes you and me responsible for truth and for knowing truth, and for living truth. A Christian understands the truth, not as something that you know, but in something that you are. There is an infinite difference between knowing the truth and being the truth. Now, you cannot know the truth if you are not first the truth. So knowing the truth follows the course of being the truth. So what he's saying here is that you may be able to say, I know the truth, but that must be preceded by you being the truth. You can't know the truth unless you are the truth and living the truth. There, right. cannot, yeah, there cannot be a separation from knowing the truth and being the truth. To be the truth is one and the same thing as knowing the truth. But knowing the truth is not one and the same thing as being the truth. Right. It, it kind of sets up the... Um the epistemological issue that we see a lot of times like if you were colorblind you in a sense know that apples are red because that's what's been communicated to you but you really don't know that because you have no experiential dimension to it right right just so, yeah so i says i i only know the truth when it becomes life in me and he says that the truth is like food in this sense in that it builds the body but it does so spiritually. It becomes part of who we are. So, you know, we talk about, we'll talk about a little bit about does this conflict with the idea of works versus faith? Um, so we'll kind of keep that in mind as we go through this. Is, is he setting aside and saying uh, that works is actually truth as opposed to faith? But we'll see here. Uh, he says that it's a monstrous error to try to impart Christianity by, by lecturing. And this has even changed Christianity. They've turned Christianity into something that one knows through understanding, something that exists in the world of knowledge. But the primitive form of Christianity understood that to know the truth was a form of being. So, and, and this has always become one of the things of existentialism, where the emphasis is on being, existing, and so here, I think he, this idea in him shines brightly uh, that, yes, he's absolutely 
uh, the father of existentialism here, but he meant it to be applied to Christianity, not right. atheism, <laughs> with, uh, with uh, others ha after him have, have applied it. It was meant to be applied to Christianity uh, to really understand it. When the truth is the way, uh, meaning how Jesus uses it when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No essential change is perceivable between one who goes through truth first or second, which he calls the foregoer and the successor. Uh, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit here. The first one does not shorten the path for the second. The confusion has been responsible for bringing conceit and misunderstanding of the triumphant church, for they regarded truth as a result, something that you discover. Uh, and we'll see that he's applying this to the idea of the uh, Christendom as opposed to Christianity. Truth is not a result, but a way that one must live. So it's not that we arrive at the truth and game over, we're done. No, it, that's the beginning. Arriving at the truth is not the end. It's not the result. It's that which now gives us life to continue on, living life, generating life. Uh, the misconception here has caused Christians to think that they instantly become a Christian, at least as though they accomplish something and the battle is over and they are already victorious. So he's bringing us to the point to, to try to see that Christendom has has thought of themselves as being the triumphant church rather than the church militant as though the war is already over now that i'm a christian i'm triumphant so he's going to kind of dig his heels in on that so he gives us examples of this first of all about uh uh accomplishing the truth or being a result he says a few uh, i'm sorry uh, an example of the difference between going through the truth first as opposed as going through the truth second. If you were a teacher, uh, which you have been, uh, or we are, let's say we're teachers of Kierkegaard, we could spend many hours learning about Kierkegaard, studying about the particular time in history that he existed and uh, his philosophies and all of his books, and we could become experts in Kierkegaard. I, and I, I, I kind of I kind of think we are. <laughs> okay, so let's let's hope we are at this point. Yeah. Uh, and then you have you can go teach it to others, and as you teach it to others, you kind of shorten the time. <clears throat> excuse me. You shorten the time that it takes students to learn what you learn. You give them the shortcuts. Uh, uh, I, don't, uh, uh, I don't. I don't think that's possible with Kierkegaard. <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe, maybe for other philosophers. Okay. Well, the, the idea, though, is uh, I'm trying to apply it to something current, sure. but this yeah. is the idea that whatever it is, and he says, even if you studied a language and you became a teacher of a language, the whole idea is you spend time doing all the research and all of the books, and then the kids come into class and you teach them in, uh, you know, one semester, a lot of things that it took you years to learn. So he says, in this case, the first one through shortens the time of the second person through, if you were to consider this as true. But it's different here when we speak about the real truth, for there's no difference between the foregoer and the successor. There's no difference between the pastor or the teacher and the man in the pew. The pastor and teacher simply point to Jesus and say, he is your truth. We think that the pastor must come up with some elaborate, eloquent sermon that will define the truth precisely to make it easier for us to understand because of him. Uh, and sometimes even the pastor believes that he can do this. But his role is not to make life easier for people, but to point to Jesus as the pattern to follow, one that even he must follow. So, Truth begins over and over again for each person who is introduced to Christ. So each time a person is converted, he doesn't pick up where the last person left off. He has to start the trail, start the walk right from the very beginning There's and no, relearn. There, 
Right. There's no standing on the shoulders of giants in the matters of, uh, of Christian, Christian religion. It's not like, it's not like a field of inquiry where, you know, let's say we're, you know, we're doing something in quantum physics and we're like, well, who, who determined what, uh, the, the, this or that about the electron. Well, it doesn't matter. It's already settled science. We're just going to keep going into the further <laughs> and deeper and deeper and deeper and start talking about muons and gluons. Christianity doesn't work like that. No. You, have, you have to begin it to be you have to learn it all over each time. All over again each time. There's no reason to stand as though we are already triumphant. Only those who have followed the way throughout their life and at the end of their life can say, I am now a member of the triumphant church. But by that time, life is over. <laughs> so this is the point that he's trying to make, that we, we endure all life as the militant church, fighting, fighting sin, trying to become a better man, a better Christian. Uh, and finally, at the end of our life is when we transcend into the triumphant church. But at that point, we're dead. We're now in the triumphant church. Okay, so on page 188, he says, if a person believes what Jesus said about the truth being the way, he will understand that the truth triumphant is really a vain conceit that there is really only a church militant that is in this life. So he's saying we cannot say, I'm a member of the church triumphant. The best we could say is I'm a member of the church militant because I'm still struggling. And so is the church still struggling. What he's saying is that in this world, Christians live in the church militant in that we are always fighting the battle as an individual and as a group against evil. The church triumphant is the church in heaven after the church has won and finished its battle. If you think that you are already in the church triumphant, it will create a sense of vanity in you. I'm, I'm already there. I'm better than you guys that are still fighting the battle, you know. Uh, and, and that is what he's, he's going to discuss in a, in a minute here. Uh, we can speak about the church triumphant in eternity because there we will share God's glory through Christ with him. But in the church triumphant, people have to see their Christianity as a truth different than living the way. So if you are going to say you're in the church triumphant now, then you have to look at the idea of truth a little differently because you're, you're beginning to believe now that truth is in fact something external. It's something that I come to, I've been given, and now I'm there and I'm finished. The truth as the way requires living it rather than merely thinking it. If the church believes that truth is simply ob uh, objectively or, or think of it in objective terms, then it does not require walking and living in it, but just knowing it. The truth would then be the result. The emphasis would not be on the way or the individual and his responsibility before God as a decision. So there would be really very little decisiveness when it comes to truth. If we were confronted with truth, it would just simply a matter of, oh, okay, you've convinced me, I'm done, and I'm ready to move on to the next thing, God. But what he's saying is, no, it, it's not a result. Uh, it's, it's the way we walk. It's, it creates that responsibility between us and God. We are confronted with the truth. And therefore, it, it goes beyond mere decisiveness, acceptance of the truth. To say, I've, I'm a Christian because I've accepted the truth isn't enough. You've got to say, I'm a Christian because I live the truth. Okay? It would be more a sense of cooperation where you would belong to a membership since you belong to the same objective truth. So if you are belonging to a particular religion, a particular form, even form of Christianity that we might refer to as a cult, and they would say, here's the truth that you have to believe. Read this book, and if you believe it, you become one of us. And you learn the secret handshake. And you get to wear the magic underwear. Then it would be an objective cooperation where you now become a member merely by your acceptance of truth. 
Christ's teaching is exalted over any scientific discoveries or other such objective truths. So when it comes to Christ, we don't look at it in the same way. And you, you brought some excellent examples how the scientific community looks at truth. But Christians don't look at truth in the same way. I mean, it's like a the physicist becoming an atomic particle to understand it. And he can't do that. He can only understand it from the outside. So atomic energy is still external to him. And he can only grasp it with uh, his his mental acceptance that this is truth. But he so, can't. Let, let, me, let me potentially play devil's advocate here for people that might want to tangle with us on this issue but don't have the ability to chime in. You and I may have to rework or to re-examine and prove to ourselves the foundational axioms of Christianity and our own faith commitments throughout our entire walk. But they might say that's Bob and Luke may do that, but the vast majority of Christians do not do that. In fact, they just sort of blindly accept what they were born into, indoctrinated with, and they keep passing it on. It's a very simple thing that they never even really challenge. Um, in one sense, in one sense, Kierkegaard has a problem with that, right? Yeah. Uh, but, but in another sense, there's some there is a virtue into having that sort of childlike faith. So how do we? How do we manage this? Because not everybody's given the luxury of intellect and time like you and I have to, to ponder these, these matters so extensively. What are we, we to make through a Kierkegaardian lens of the simple people with their simple Christian faith who are, in fact, uh, just carrying on some sort of ancestral right? I mean... Well... Uh how, how, how would you handle that? I mean, how would you handle someone who's got that that very simple faith? Because, yeah, so I'll, I'll just okay. I'll, I'll allow you to uh, elaborate on that. Well, Kierkegaard called those people who who go beyond the simplicity of faith Christendom, and that's who he's speaking about here. And it doesn't mean that it only Christendom only existed in Kierkegaard's time, because it certainly exists in our time as well. So. When we speak and we say, well, you know, the simple-minded people, not, you know, when we compare them to us, super brains, you know, what we're actually seeing is we are the ones who are in the weakness. We are the ones that are creating or becoming counterproductive because we're beginning to believe that we are better than the simple faith, and we're not. The, the, those who have the simple faith believe in the truth and live the truth. That's as simple as it is, simple as it becomes. When we start uh, getting into the area of what is truth like Pilate and trying to find some philosophical kernel to truth that we can now say, I know the truth. We are counterproductive to what Kierkegaard is speaking about here. Uh, so we, and actually kind of shows our deficiency in understanding what truth really is. So we, we always have to be on guard so that we don't drift away into that area and turn Christianity into Christendom. And there is, Luke, there's definitely a, a, uh, a craving to do that. Of course. There, there's a desire to go, you know, to, to go off the road, so to speak, and say, hey, I wonder what's down this little road over here. You know, instead of staying on the main road. So we, we always have to be on guard not to drift away into that intellectual Christendom. Uh, so hopefully that, that gives an answer or a semblance of an answer. Well, I, I, think, that's, I think that's correct. I think, the, I think the objection I was, and I, I think it was a really appropriate response and really in line with what Kierkegaard would say in a certain respect. I guess what I'm just trying to think is about individuals who's like they're they're adults but their but their faith commitments haven't changed since they were three or four years old or something like that they haven't they haven't gone deeper into it i guess i don't i'm trying to think i'm trying to think about how how to properly articulate this 
Well, I think I understand what you're saying. Let, let me let me respond this way. Yes, there are people who have a childlike faith, but they don't go into it any more than that. And I don't mean go into it intellectually. I mean they don't they don't think about it. They don't meditate upon it. They don't you know when you walk in Christ, you just don't walk forward. You also walk into a depth of Christ. And I think that's an evidence of someone walking into the depths of Christ. If you are where you were when you were 10 years old and you know more know more about Christ, you don't do any more about Christ than you did when you were 10, I would say that's evidence is you're not walking upward. You're not walking towards Christ. You may be standing five years ago, but you're not walking. Yeah, and I think I, I think I think I understand the difference after you've said this. So when I am saying that people have a childlike faith in Christ that it really has not has not changed from age three to thirty three, and they still have this sort of simple profession of it, only externally does it seem that way. Um, they may not have done the philosophical sort of critique of it from an outside vantage point that you and I are, have been seduced to do, right? By going into yeah. all that. But they certainly have undergone some sort of trial that's allowed them to go deeper into that inherited worldview. So they, never, they may never step outside of the inherited worldview, question it, test it, develop proofs and arguments and historical uh, documentation. Right? They may be totally uninterested in that. But that doesn't mean that they aren't going deeper into it um, in a way that we can't see or discern. How, 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 do you think that's a proper way to? Yeah, well, to, Paul talked about it as we grow into like an adulthood in Christ. Uh, as a child, we think of childish things. But when you get to adulthood, you think of, of, of deeper things. And so it, it's not the intellectual depth. It's it's knowing Christ in a deeper way. So if, if you don't know Christ in a deeper way than you did when you were five years old, then you need to examine yourself because you've probably not moved from that point. I think the way Kierkegaard would say, you have not taken that movement. So they don't, step. they don't, we, we could say this, they may not know Christ in a deeper intellectual way, but yeah. that doesn't matter because knowing Christ intellectually is not the nature of the relationship. The nature of the relationship is to have a deeper experiential knowing of Christ and that they do have. So yeah. even if their faith um, proclamations, declarations, argumentations, all these things are as simple as they were when they were seven years old, it's no indication of the depth of their experiential knowledge of Christ. Right, now if you, want to compare it the opposite way. There are theologians who know a great deal about Christ who really don't have any deeper faith in Christ than they did when they were five years old. So merely knowing the, the, uh, the technicalities of Christianity and being able to quote scripture and being able to quote church fathers and, mm -hmm. and so forth doesn't mean you know Christ any more deeper than you did when you were five years old. It's how you live your life. Right. So, so we could have scenarios where someone has this grotesque prolixity of an apprehension of, of Christian doctrine, but have, have a very shallow Christian faith. And you could have the a, a deaf and dumb and mute person who who could have a much richer, deeper spiritual life in Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So, definitely yeah. possible. So it's an eternity higher than these. He says his truth is not a discovery of something true, but that the truth is the way in which one must walk. It is who one is and how one exists. So, Truth is not something that we find in the sense of we discover it uh, as an object, but something that we come to and, uh, well, 
I won't, I won't try to say what it is. I won't try to define, I fall into my own trap here. But so <laughs> I'll, I'll just uh, continue. When people assume that there is an established Christendom, remember not Christianity, but Christendom, there's an attempt to create the triumphant church. So it's kind of like we were saying, it's kind of characteristic of those people who believe that they've discovered the truth. They have the truth as an object. Uh, they tend to be those who are in Christendom, and they tend to think that they are now in the triumphant church. And this is what Kierkegaard is trying to tell us, uh, that this was happening during his time. But I, I believe it's also happening in our time. And I think he wrote it with that in that vein, I, I, although the, maybe there's nothing that says it. When he wrote the present age, I think he wasn't saying, this is my present age. I think he was extending it to saying, hey, this is your present age too. <laughs> this is just humanity and how it thinks and works. What do you think? I think that, I mean, it's, a, it's interesting. In some ways, I wish that his pronostication about what our future would have been would have been more correct. I yeah. don't know. If, I don't know if he could have anticipated the the atheism and the nihilism and the uh, agnosticism of, of the secular age or of the of the twentieth century. I don't know. I don't know which is worse, right? It, to have a you know to have a a spiritually vacuous complete Christendom or to have, um, I mean, to, to have, to have so many people who've never even had the, who've never been raised with any biblical knowledge or God and in their entire lives and have filled yeah. that vacuum with, with other belief systems. So, I, you know, I, I, you know, so I, I think it is, and it is, applicable to our age. I think he underestimated I think he underestimated how secular the um, West would become. Well I, I did too. I mean 10 years ago I never would have dreamed the world would be like this. Uh as far as the God and the church and, and society. I never I, I it was beyond my imagination. So I, I couldn't have seen it. Uh but whenever I read Kierkegaard, uh, I don't read him as though it were history. I, I read him as though he's talking to me in my time and the church Christendom is out there right now. So uh, it's living to me. It's a living document when I read Kierkegaard. I don't know if that's how everybody reads it, but that's how I, I read it anyway. Uh, and I would recommend that. That helps people, I think, to, to read it that way because that's how you learn. If you say, oh, well, you know, this is about them and I'm not part of that, and then you become more pharisaical. <laughs> So he says the church on one hand, speaking about the church militant, is always in the process of becoming. But Christendom simply is and does not become. It's a cooperation rather than a living existence. This is, a, this is an interesting paragraph here because he's talking about <clears throat> the church militant. And that's good in the sense. We want to think of ourselves as being in the church militant, that we're constantly at battle with sin and evil. Uh, and because of that, that confrontation, we're always in the process of moving forward, becoming. And that's how I like to think of myself as an individual. I'm always becoming. Actually, I even think of God in that way. God is always becoming. Really, you do? Yes. He, he's always becoming, not in the sense of he's inventing himself, but he's revealing himself. <clears throat> so as far as me and God, he's becoming to me, because I'm seeing more and more of God that already exists. So I don't mean he's inventing himself. So thank you for bringing that. Yeah, I, I was going to say whether or not he would be becoming would be relative to the perspective, because outside of you can only become if you're inside of time. So outside of time, right? There's a so, completeness. Suppose that's exactly right. When God enters time, he becomes, and that's why. If you follow that thinking, you'll see that's really the biblical thinking of it. Whenever God enters into time, he becomes to us because we see more and more of him. Uh, but Chris, uh, <clears throat> Christendom, not Christianity, doesn't become. It just stays where it is. It's a co-op. It's a corporation or uh, yeah, it's a corporation. 
rather than a living existence. Uh, it becomes a, a, an entity that doesn't do anything. It has a... a, it's, big, a non it's big business. <laughs> yeah, it does. And it has a nominal existence in name, but it, it doesn't... You know, even if it produces something, it doesn't really change. It's that kind of a corporation. Christendom has an impatience in that it wants to anticipate eternity, and therefore it tries to create itself as a triumphant church. So when, when people start a church and it becomes really big, really tied up into things, they want to think about it in terms of eternity, as though, you know, we're better than everybody else. We have a, a link to eternity here, uh, whereas nobody else does. It, it, it begins to think of itself as a triumphant church. We have gained ground right here. We are better than all the other churches. So what, so want, you, so what you put a church on the moon? <laughs> Yeah, claim, could, claim the moon for God. <laughs> yeah, they could do that. Uh, Mars and Mars and the sun. It, <laughs> they want to introduce triumph into the temporal world as though we have already accomplished the way. And, and this is well, well phrased by him. They want to take triumph, which is something that belongs in eternity with Christ, and they want to put it in the temporal world with them as though somehow they've accomplished something. But what this does is actually abolishes true Christianity. As soon as Christ's kingdom befriends the world, there is no Christianity. Once you're friends with the world, you're no longer a Christ. Now, this is difficult when we talk about living. How do we live in a world we, we, we can't befriend it. What does that mean to befriend the world? Uh, you are no longer Christ's friend. It's well, like. As someone who has gone through it. Okay. I, let's I, hear it. I would say that it feels like this. Okay. It feels like, it, it feels like if, if you have a foot in the world and you have a foot in, in the Christian life, there is great fluctuation of your, of your priorities, maybe during a, moment of crisis or whatever right. your relationship with christ becomes the most important thing in your life but if things start going so well other things become more important love lust money art whatever else yeah at least in my own experience fully separate fully separating as if i can put that into air quotes as if it's ever done uh -huh. and, and that separation process is that there's a definitive prioritization of the god relationship and everything and I'm not even sure, and everything else is a very distant second. That's what it yeah. feels like to me as someone who has divorced himself from the world as a result of prioritization of the Christ relationship. And by the way, I just want to reiterate, I think my moon church idea is is really, it, I, I think I think so, you know, we, we got, I, I, I just think this is a really great idea. We got, I mean, the time is now. Well, if you do, you can't use the name Moonies because that's already <laughs> taken. <laughs> You'll have to call yourself something else. Oh man! The, how, would, do you think we could call ourselves the Apollyons? Would that would that would that go over well? Apollyons. The, uh, yeah, the, we, the, we'll consider them. We'll put that on the list. The world would love that church. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, what we are talking about is exactly right. Because you were talking about a polarization that takes place. And that's what Kierkegaard is speaking about. Because there's a difference between those in the world and those in the church, because of that, and only because of that, we can call it the church militant. Uh, because it's a polarization. It is, uh, it is the church at war with the world. So what then is the church triumphant? How do we have a church triumphant if we have such polarization? Once the contention is passed, and when there is nothing left to contend with, that is the church triumphant. And the only way that's going to happen is if Jesus comes again. Right? The only way it's going to truly happen is yes. Yeah. But 
there's another way the church can kind of make friends with the world and and unpolarize it so that we're no longer separate from the world and now as Kierkegaard will explain we have something different that takes place here but, but uh, to continue on with his thought before I get just a little ahead of myself when the church as it's existed in his time and in ours has become synonymous with the world the opposition has become unrecognizable by all appearances the church is triumphant this is Christendom so when when pastors and professing Christians imitate the world and say it's okay because I'm a Christian now so I can imitate the world and I can look like the world and I can act like the world because underneath I'm a Christian they're falling into this trap of Christendom and falling into this trap of thinking they're triumphant already and they're doing this by making friends with the world, neutralizing this area, this boundary between the world and between the church. In this world, Christ's church can only survive through contention as it fights for its survival. Now, this may be unacceptable to many people, Luke. Even, even maybe some of our audience hears this and says, are you kidding me? So then you're not supposed to go out and make peace with the world. I thought Jesus was up for peace and love and harmony with the world. Uh, no, he brings a sword, right? So it's brother against brother. He does. And that's, soon, that's usually forgotten in people's ambition to, to seek peace above truth. Well, that's, so we, that's, that's, been the, that's the effort to turn Jesus Christ into Jesus Christ superstar, some kind of hippie. It is. It is exactly, and and it continues on today, where pastors want to be, want to be cool. They want to imitate the world. They want people to think that they are, they are uh, idealized, and therefore, it's acceptable now that somehow they think that their worldliness makes Christianity more acceptable. I'm a pastor, but I'm also a professional surfer. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of some things a little bit more obvious, but, but yeah, yeah, that's the idea. This triumphant church can also integrate with the world when it sees itself as sinners, just like those in the world where there's no difference. So this is kind of a watering down of the church, where the church begins to imitate the world as though, yeah, you know, you don't have to really change to belong to my church. You can be who you are, come as you are, act as you are, and we'll baptize you. You can become part of the church triumphant. Just so long as you make that steady donation. A steady donation is amended. <laughs> this church triumphant as Christendom does not resemble the church militant. Okay, so I'm going to do take a rare moment and read some of Kierkegaard. And... Don't want to make the mistake. I have to use my reading glasses, Luke. The last time I tried to read, I I couldn't read well because I need two separate glasses. Yeah. 190, page 190, the bottom of page 190 here. Imagine a Christian of those ages when the church was truly militant. In other words, way back in the beginning. It would be perfectly impossible for him to recognize the church in its present perversion. He would hear Christianity preached and would hear that, the, uh, that what was said was quite true. But to his great amazement, he would see that the actual conditions for being a Christian were exactly the opposite, what they were in his time. So that to be a Christian now is no more like being a Christian in his time than walking on one's legs is like walking on one's head. To be a Christian in this militant church means to express what it is to be a Christian within an environment which is the opposite to Christian. To be a Christian in a triumphant and established Christendom means to express what it is to be a Christian within an environment which is synonymous or homogenous with Christianity. So what he's saying is, if you are a church militant, you are a church militant because of the polarization 
between the world and the church. If the polarization disappears, like it does when the age is, uh, when Christ returns, there is only one type of people, and that is the church people, all those people who believe in Christ. And therefore, there's no longer a need for a church militant. Now you enter into the stage of the church triumphant. So, but you can't, yes, go so, ahead. So let me ask you this. So what, whether people profess to be Christian or not, they have internalized a, Christ, a lot of quote unquote Christian morality in America in 2018. Okay. I mean, they don't get me wrong. They do a lot of things that are completely abhorrent, but in general, people have, so, have sort of adopted what they think of as the, the maxims of Jesus Christ. Yes. So it's not even really, I personally don't find it very shocking for, to, to be like, to go to people and be like, Oh yeah, I'm a Christian. You should be a Christian. People go, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thanks. Or, or they're like, yeah, I already am one. I was, my family's Christian. Mm -hmm. How do we cause, how do we cause that polarization in 2018 America? I think the way I, I try to cause it is to preach purely Christ. I preach the Sermon on the Mount. I preach, I preach what's written in the New Testament, the scriptures. Um, I preach what Jesus really said um, so that people are not so anxious to have it embroidered and hang in their house. I, I emphasize in the Sermon on the Mount, not about the peace, but I emphasize the idea that uh, um, you have to be willing to cut off your hand rather than commit a sin with it. You have to be willing to gouge out your eye than to commit a sin, a visual sin. And I emphasize those things that aren't emphasized enough in the church. It's easy to live peaceably with the world, Luke. It's very easy to live peaceably with the world. Don't go against them. Go along with everything that they say. Get into the parade, so to speak. And instead, a Christian cannot march in the parade. A Christian must be antagonistic to the parade. And he can't cheer the parade on. And, and uh, there's all sorts of underlying themes there that the world is involved in and we must stay out of it. Not only stay out of it, we must fight against it. Well, what would you, well, so there are a lot of people who would be like, preach on. So, so some, something that I notice, I, I do my own sort of evangelization, but something I notice is uh, like on occasion I'll go to a baseball game or something like that, and yeah. there'll be the street there'll be these street preachers with like bull horns and big signs, and everybody's trying to go to a just trying to enjoy a baseball game, and they're standing outside the stadium talking about some of these things that you mentioned, but they're you know, they're a little bit more hellfire and brimstone, but you know, they're what what would you what do you, what would you make of that scenario? What do you think Kierkegaard would make of those scenarios? I mean, is that how we ought to be? Because those individuals are definitely polarizing and they're definitely antagonizing the world. Yeah, they are. They are. Um, and, and and I and by the, and I do it in my own so and 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 I'm not trying to sit, cause distance between myself and them. I do it in my own way too. I don't. I don't go out with a bullhorn, but I, 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 I have a. There are certain issues that cause me to enter into an antagonistic relationship with the world. So I don't know. I, I'm just kind of curious how you, what, what, how you think Kierkegaard would view those individuals that are getting on the bullhorns and. And, and declaring that the world is in a, in a state of apostasy and they need to not go to the baseball game and repent. Or, and uh, yeah, I, I can tell you how I do it. I can't tell you it's right because I'm still a work in progress. I, I approach the church differently than I approach the outsider to the church. Uh, people in the church, I they know, they ought to know, and they are living supposed to be living the life of Christianity. They are models. They're supposed to be models of Christianity. And when they're not, I try to let them know. 
I try to let them know so that they can change. Okay, I do it in love. I do it in love. I don't. I don't yell at them through a bullhorn. Uh, when it comes to outsiders to the church, I personally try to draw them into the church. So you're so, you're softer with the outsider. I'm softer when I can be. I, I begin soft. I try to draw people into the church. But this is what Jesus preaches. This is the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, I don't tame it down, but I, I don't yell it to a bullhorn either. I don't say, hey, you guys are sinners and I'm not. And if you unless you believe everything I believe, I'm better than you are. You know, I, I don't take that attitude. I take the attitude of, you know, Jesus was tortured. He died. He suffered suffered greatly to bring people into the church i don't think he'd be happy if i turned people away from the church because of my style so i, I try to draw them in with the knowledge that he died for these people and i and, and that makes it more serious to me well you know I, I i see both sides of it you know i see i used to there was a time when i would have been categorically been like oh that's not the way to do it um but i also look at the state of modern society and i'm like you know what i need a bullhorn <laughs> you know i'm a little bit more sympathetic to it well and, I, I'm not, and I'm not... I, yeah i guess what i'm trying to say is that i have a little bit more of a an attitude of i'm okay with if if i'm offensive and i drive 99 people away but sincerely draw one person in that that that's 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 a win and you know it's not like jesus was um never offensive i mean he definitely was absolutely yeah absolutely and and there's times and and this is why there's no rules there's times when we need to be like that right there's, but so i'm not saying it's wrong to be that way i'm I, i'm saying that i think that we have to be appropriate the time and that really depends upon our walk our individual walk with christ what is christ telling me to do i have to make sure that i'm not just doing this because I, it makes me feel better to do that it makes me feel righteous and holy to yell at other people you know what makes me feel righteous and holy is when i act righteous and holy and so i try to keep that distinction but i'm not seeing somebody shouldn't do that or they're they're sinning if they're doing that not at all i'm just saying they should take it seriously and remember christ died for those very people so you have to take them that seriously if you want to bring them into the church do everything you can to bring them in yeah it sounds like it's an issue that requires something we would refer to as discernment you know absolutely yeah, right absolutely. and that and I, I think that probably is right that there is a oh that's it's uh you got to have a lot of tools in your toolbox and sometimes you need to get very you know sometimes you need to sometimes you need to use a power saw and sometimes <laughs> sometimes you need to use uh you know uh, a, like a screwdriver or yeah, something a little very, tiny uh, screwdriver or, or a big like, hammer yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well we we i have about i have about seven minutes left in this room would you okay I, so let me just hand the rest of the the broadcast over to you and and thank you for entertaining my discussion questions oh no problem okay i'll, I'll go a little bit more here and then we can we can stop uh because i got a good stopping point here uh so what is he saying when what i read there page 190 and 191 is that if someone who had been in a true church militant were to come into this time so someone like paul let's say or peter who lived in the church militant uh were to come into this time uh would would he say that i'm sorry let me just start over again uh what he's saying is that if someone who had been in the true church militant were to come into this time uh he would say that they did not understand because they go to church and they hear the truth but there's something different so what he's saying, if Paul or Peter were to come to church and say, oh, yeah, it's Sunday, it's time to go to church, and he's sitting in the pew, he'd say, yeah, you know, it sounds right. I, I did write those things. I remember writing that letter, but I don't recognize the rest of it. <laughs> I don't recognize the behavior here. 
I don't see how you are the church militant. You're not taking my words correctly. They're not having the same profound uh, um, expression and result on you that they did when I first gave them. So uh, they think that they have already, these people think they've already overcome and they haven't. And he says, Kierkegaard says that the reason is because they have become harmonious with the world and so that's i think the note we can we can leave on today is that we we must be careful to live in the world but not become harmonious with the world and it's so easy to be drawn into that because they promise to remove the the, the you know, a lot of people don't like conflict. I, I don't like conflict. I don't I, I don't know if you do or not. Some people thrive on conflict. I don't like conflict and I don't like confrontation. And it's so easy to preach a Christianity that plays on that and says, no, you don't need to go out into the world and, and act like a Christian. You don't need to go out and talk to other people about Christ because I know you don't like to confront people, but just harmonize with everybody. And, Keep it all to yourself, which is what we're going to find out. Kierkegaard says is what was happening in his time. Let's just keep Christianity to ourselves and be nice people, be loving people, and keep Christ to ourselves. Because I know the the world could be cruel and they might make it tough for you. So let's not do that. Just live harmoniously with the world. So that's where I will tie the bow for today. Yeah, I thought... We have a few more minutes. So I thought I would just share earlier. I referenced uh, that that saying that Pascal had stitched into his jacket. It's actually a little bit more extensive. I, I didn't. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's actually two two uh, verses. If I could just share it real quick. Absolutely sure. So I didn't realize this, but um, the source I'm getting this from is it's a it's a preaching website called Stories for Preaching. But what they're saying is that Pascal had an intense two hour religious experience, but he kind of kept that experience a secret and had it sewn into his, his coat, what he wrote down about that experience. And it wasn't until um, after he died that they, they found it stitched into his coat. And oh. it re yeah, and it reads as follows. In the year of the Lord, 1654, Monday, November 23rd, from about half past 10 in the evening until half past 12. Fire. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of philosophers nor of the scholars. Certitude, certitude, feeling, joy, peace. God of Jesus Christ, my God and thy God, thy shall be my God. Forgetfulness of the world and of everything except God. He is to be found only by the man, I'm sorry, he is to be found only by the ways taught in the gospel. Greatness of the soul of man. Righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. Joy, 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 tears of joy. Jesus Christ, I have fallen away. I have fled from him, denied him, crucified him. May I not fall away forever. We keep hold of him only by the ways taught in the gospel. Renunciation, total and sweet, total submission to Jesus Christ and to my director. Eternally in joy for a day's exercise on earth. I will not forget thy word. Amen. And uh, yeah, I just thought that was interesting. I'd only heard the, the first part about the God of the philosophers versus the God yeah. of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I didn't realize it was so extensive. So, wow, that's that pretty neat. No, yeah. and that's Pascal, right? You said mm -hmm. Pascal. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot. He was an extremely smart man. Yeah, some people would say that he. Some people claim that he was the true father of existentialism, and that. But, I, 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 I yeah. And then, it, and then it goes, some people would even say that Plato is, it, it, you know, well, that's a whole matter for debate. I, I think that there are strands of it uh, in, in Christ. Yeah. And, and even in the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament, there's strands of it. So I don't think anybody can really lay claim to being the father of it. I think that it is. Uh, that's, that's just how the scholars divide up. Yeah, uh, divide up time. It's it's an artificial construct, and art. I don't think you're Kierkegaard. Right. I don't think Kierkegaard cares too much for the trophy. You're right. You're right. Uh, I, I mean, yeah. It was kind of like when I finally got my when I finally got my PhD. 
I, I, that's my the my entire life I wanted to be called doctor, and then I went through this like massive Christian transformation, uh -huh. and, then, and then when I could be called doctor, I've not allowed anyone to call me doctor. <laughs> I really doubt I really doubt, doubt Kierkegaard wants the plaque for being father of existentialism. Probably not. Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. So okay. All right. Well, let's bring it too close. Thank you very everybody for listening, and um, I'll have this edited and up on Noetic and SoundCloud and YouTube and uh, iTunes. Is it on iTunes? Yeah, or whatever, as soon as, as soon as I can. All right, have a great day, everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.